Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, the founder of the Popper Party of Ontario. And uh, Sunday, November the 13th is Usury Free Day in Canada, run by Tom Kennedy, my erstwhile ally in the lead system promotion. And I was a speaker there, and this is my speech to the uh, Usury Free Day at Occupy Toronto. And that took place at the Conspiracy Culture Bookshop on Queen Street in Toronto. And I hope that you find it interesting. At the end, I'm going to have an interview with Tom Kennedy. And I want to say that on Thursday, the 24th of November, I'll be speaking at the Holiday Express in 374 Dundas, 7 o'clock at night in London, Ontario, about setting up popper party operations there. Well, if there's a lot of people who are newbies here and don't know me, well, this could end up being a wild presentation. I'm John the Engineer Termel. I started wearing this symbolic white hard hat in my second election when I realized that I wasn't going to get any attention to mainstream media. And it's been a great symbol ever since. A lot of people know the guy with the white hard hat protesting banks, but they don't know it's me. So I'm going to take maybe 20 minutes to go over the history, and then I'm going to spend the last time talking about recent developments that are pretty spectacular. Uh, back in the early 1970s, I was finishing my degree in electrical engineering at Carleton when they started up the new mathematics of gambling course. And it had been given by my old engineering math professor, and I took it, and I learned how to count cards at blackjack, and I went on my first junket and started making a lot of money. And then I learned how to play poker optimally and started making big money. And then when I graduated, I was offered a job up in Iron Ore Company, Settil, Quebec, up in the boonies, and I thought I'd make money playing poker with them, you know, but uh, six bucks an hour for an engineer, and I'm making 15 at home playing poker, and 40 an hour down in Las Vegas playing blackjack. Professor Schneider said, John, you've got to be an idiot to go work as an engineer. Be the teaching assistant in my mathematics and gambling course, and try being a professional gambler. Keep going to Vegas. I said, yeah, okay, sounds like fun. <laughs> so I did. I was the assistant in the mathematics gambling course. Then after a while, I started getting barred in Vegas. And I went on 55 junkets in five years, had wonderful adventures, took them for all kinds of money. But then they started barring me. Because you spot a card counter by watching how he plays. You're keeping track of, there's a lot of tens in the deck that Peter goes bust more often because he's got a hit you don't. But if there are very few tens, they're all gone. Well, now he's not going to go bust. So you bet more when there's tens in the deck. You bet less when there's little cards in the deck. And that's all we got to do is watch the deck. And if your bets go up when they would, and your bets go down when they do, that's how I can spot a card counter. And that's how they spotted me. So they came up and said, Mr. Chamel at the Hilton, I just beat him for five grand on my second junket. 1974 money, that's huge. OK, that's like 30 or 40 now. And they said, Mr. Turmel, we want you to restrict your action of the dice pits. And I said, well, why? You can't beat dice, but you lose slowly. He said, me, you don't know? I said, come on, you got your fair chance to break me. And he said, no, sir, we have no chance at all. <laughs> so, so I are right, too, you know. I mean, because in those days, one deck, I could beat it 4.5%. That's why I used to go on the junkets to Caesar's Chariot. I'd play on the plane with the millionaires with one deck. In Vegas, it was four, and the edge is diluted. So I got barred. I decided, how come I can play poker in Canada legally with no rake-off, fair game, and not blackjack, now that blackjack's a game of skill, too? So I wrote the Crown Attorney, said I'm starting to run blackjack games in Ottawa. And, uh, well, they busted me, charged me, convicted me, and now watch me go. So I became Ottawa's gambling crusader. In 1978, Supreme Court had a decision that said, this is not a gaming house because it's a one-night stand. And a gaming house is there to impugn the reputation of the neighborhood. But if you're only there one night, you're not impugning the reputation of the neighborhood. That's not a gaming house. So I incorporated the transient casino. How many guys, how many guys remember Paladin? Remember Paladin? I had half game, will travel. Okay? So, but they kept busting me and busting me until 1988, where I won a case. And that was really neat. The judge found me not guilty. So I finally went to run blackjack legally. Well, next thing you know, I got the first casino in Quebec. Where is it? 
<laughs> and of course they busted me there too and then changed the meaning of the law to get me. First casino in Quebec. So I came back to Ontario and they left me alone. Now Tom had been my casino cashier through all these casinos and he was never there when they busted him, so he might have been the mole. No, 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 no. We know who Sergeant Fotilla was. He was the mole. He came and testified, said everybody had fun on this game, and then the judge still convicted me. But in 93, I ran the biggest casino, 28-table underground game, 21 blackjack, and the trick was I had one table where you had the right to be the banker back against me. So, you can go play blackjack against one of my agents where you're losing at 1%, or you can take the bank against me where you're losing at 3 or 4. So, I force him to play one hand, but then for sure the judge is convinced that I was not excluding him from being the bank, and that was my loophole. And we had a whole summer of ads in the newspapers, where are they, Casino Chermel, Kaz Car at the track, City of Ottawa mayors complaining, how come we can't have a casino in Termel, Ken? <laughs> and then a few days later, after this huge big story in the Ottawa Citizen, they just bust me again, even if I'd been acquitted. And after changing the meaning of a word, they got convicted me, and uh, I was facing, uh, what, 10 years in jail for proceeds of crime, a million bucks, and uh, plus the gaming house conviction. So anyway, here's what they decided. First of all, the cops called it Project Robin Hood <laughs> because I was spending the money in neat ways. So anyway, the law was if I had any money left and I was hiding it, they could jail me for 10 years because I made more than a million bucks. Mm. But I knew the only way to beat the charge was to spend it all, go broke, get a friend to lend me a new three grand bank bankroll to go play poker again. And I did that. And so I went to court, said I'm broke, spent it all. I founded a political party with the money, ran for prime minister, to f push interest-free money and other stuff, and that's going to come into account later. Then had a lot of can 80 candidates, more than the Greens, but I blew the million. I went broke, and then they searched the year for money and finally admitted, yeah, yeah, Robin Hood doesn't have any money left. <laughs> so I got back on my feet, and in 2000, I got invited to the United Nations because I'd run for Prime Minister as an NGO with my abolitionist party. Abolitionist? We want to abolish! Well, that was the old anti-slavery movement of the United States. And I like to explain that they're the guys who got rid of the slavery with the metal chains, and we're the new abolitionists coming here to get rid of the invisible slavery with the debt chains. <laughs> So, but that got us in. Now, what's neat about the party was in 1984, we ran into Michael Linton that we've been talking about earlier. And Michael Linton had written the first barter software called Green Dollars. And he needed that I put this on my lapel when I go to elections, okay? That's, everybody else got a little red button with their name and mine's got a button with software, okay? What's your party? You know, I got software. So anyway, and it was the green dollar system. You pledge your time or collateral, and you get an interest-free credit card in your system, and you use their poker chips, and they used to transfer it by telephone. Transfer 10 credits from my account to his account, and that worked fine. I figure it's better with physical chips, like a casino, but it was fine. I financed the first let system. So, back after 1993, they bust me. I run for parliament and prime minister. Then, because of that, I got this invitation to do the speech at the United Nations during the Millennium Assembly Forum on the Declaration, the Millennium Declaration, because the clerk of the Globalization Committee had been a single mother in Australia who had belonged to a Let's in Perth, then another Let's somewhere else, and she was moving to another place with a Let's and she was going to join it too, and she convinced the chairwoman that this was a program that helps people right now. And if we can get it somehow on the Millennium Agenda, it's going to be able to hold, help the whole planet right now. So anyway, these two stalwart women and one guy named Fried Schmitter from Sweden who was in the audience, and every time it came up, he was clapping, pushed, and he went to the committee meetings, pushed through Resolution C6 on the United Nations Millennium Declaration to restructure the global financial architecture with an alternative time-based currency called Unilets. Now, LET stands for Local Employment Trading Software. 
Okay? You join up, you register what you do, I'll babysit, I'll walk the dog, I'll fix your car. Everybody puts up, there's a directory of goods and services, you all get 500 chips, and you start calling each other up. And my best example is they go, isn't that tax evasion? Because they always see Barter's tax evasion, it's interest evasion. And the example I use is Tom Kennedy. He joined the Ottawa Let system and was the biggest trader around 1984, 3,000 extra bucks in income. Well, you got to declare that because it's regular earnings if you're tutoring people and you're a school teacher. So, what am I going to do? I've got this 3,000 in green dollars, which I'm not going to spend to free up the 3,000 in my teacher's salary in my bank account. And now they want 1,000 in cash and extra income tax out of that 3,000 in my teacher's salary bank account I'm not using anymore. So after I send that, I'm left with two G's I can pay down my debts with. <coughs> so every transaction you do in a barter system does not save you tax. You got to pay your tax. It saves you the interest. It frees up the federal cash for you to pay down your debts. And that is the advantage of these barter systems and people who belong to them. So anyway, at the United Nations, they passed the Unilets resolution. So for the next 10 years now, it's talking up time banking, you know. Well, I coined the expression the time standard of money in my speech at the UN. Imagine, 25 years in politics and I never thought of calling it the time standard compared to the gold standard. But I mean, you could bring your gold to the bank as collateral if you got any. And you can bring your time as the bank as collateral in the new game. So imagine it's like a big Bank of Canada PayPal, where you log on, open an account, you can pledge your Visa card or 100 hours of labor. And you can pay it back with cash or 100 hours of labor by working on one of the government projects offered to people who want to pay off their Bank of Canada PayPal with labor. So that is how, now of course a doctor, he can charge six hours per hour in his practice, but when he's cleaning the park with his grandson, they're both getting 12 green dollars an hour, basic kid volunteer wage. But doctors can charge 60, 70, 80, whatever the standard rate is. So there's normal capitalistic competition, except everybody gets to be a capitalist, not just the guys with gold and with stuff. So the flaw in the capitalistic system is that only the guys with collateral, born with collateral, or their families have collateral, can get a loan to get into the game. But once we make the collateral basis human time, then we can all get chips to get into the game. <clears throat> and as for interest, usury, well, my granddad used to say, I call it Adelard's axiom number one, money has no babies. Now, in the old days, <laughs> Ezekiel 18.8, I believe, denounced the wicked and the rich. He who exacts usury or excessive interest. Well, now recent definitions say that usury is excessive interest. Recently. But yet, Ezekiel denounced usury and or excessive interest. What's the difference? Well, my granddad said, if you charge interest on grain or on cows, well, they have babies and they can pay an increase. But if you charge too much, you know, all the, all the calves and you owe more, well, that could be excessive interest denounced by God in Ezekiel. But if you charge 1% interest on gold or silver or computer credits that don't have babies, that creates a death gamble, a mortgage, a game of musical chairs where not everybody who borrowed 10 can come back with 11. Now, I use the perfect example of a pump house. Everybody pledges their watch for collater as collateral at the pump house and they all borrow 10 liters of liquidity. And they all dump it into the economic pool, producing goods and stuff. And now they put their goods and stuff for sale for 11. Well, if you sell and you come out with 11 and he sells and he comes out with 11, at the end of the game, you got some guys can't sell. No money left. So, how many people saw Zeke Geist Addendum? Okay. In Zeke Geist Addendum, there's an equation. My equation. Back in ni early 1980s, I developed a simple equation. I said, okay, everybody got 100, P principle. Everybody owes 11 times 10, 110, P plus I. So how many guys are going to make it come out of the pool and pay off their debt and get their watch back? 100 out of 110. How many guys are going to get knocked out? 10 out of 110, the remainder. Well, Zeitgeist Addendum has the equation P over P plus I for the number of guys who are going to survive. 
but they didn't finish it off by subtracting that from one to get the number of guys who get knocked out. And that's neat because when the guy who can't pay comes up to the banker, the banker says, you can't pay, sorry, I take your watch. Then he says to the winners, how many chips you got? A hundred? Gee, now there's only nine watches. Your chips have inflated. Economics teaches inflation is an increase. If you got a hundred bucks chasing ten watches, Economics teaches that inflation is an increase in the money chasing the watches. I'm the discoverer of shift B inflation, a decrease in the watches being chased by the same chips. Feels the same. Got your eyes closed and they say it's up over here, it's up over here, must play up over here. Well, that's always been down over there. So, here's the math. Ten guys put up their watches collateral, one guy gets squeezed up, gets his collateral confiscated. Well, that's how much shift B inflation will happen. They tell you inflation is an increase in the money chasing the watches, and they want to fight that by raising interest rates. And I'm saying, whoa, it's actually the same money chasing less watches after all this foreclosure. And I can prove it. Back in 1982, I was, uh, I go to the Occupy demonstrations every Saturday with my big picket sign. And I show them a picture from 1982. Um, where I was arrested picketing the IMF World Bank. And I like to point out, this was before most of you kids were even born, when I was all alone, before anybody even knew they were a problem. But, now what's neat about that is, I was passing out a flyer, and uh, five years later, I read about what I now call the Argentine solution. Cash-starved Argentine provinces turning out their own money. And now, I, during the last provincial election, I would ask everybody on camera and down at Occupy, i say, here's Argentina, we're broke in 2001, all their foreign debt paid off in 2006. How'd they do that? Most people heard about going bust, but didn't hear about everything paid off five years later. I said, the union said, you're not going to lay us off because you got no money. We're going to take small denomination provincial bonds. We can pay our HTML. Hydro, taxes, medical, and licenses with. And that way all our families, all our businesses, everybody's going to want this new kind of provincial bond currency. And that's what we're going to take. And they ended up laying nobody off, hiring more people, and being out of debt in five years. Wow! We can do that too! As a matter of fact, every tax collecting entity can pay their people with small denomination bonds. And if they link it to the time standard of money, then a bond from any village anywhere is good here. Somebody comes here to me with an Ithaca hour $10 bill, I'll take it. Even if I'm not going back there for a while, someone else might, but it's still an asset to me. So we have this now. The Argentine situation, why I love that is because that's when I, when I was being arrested by that cop in Toronto. I was handing out flyers that were saying, why bring your million dollar bond to New York to get a million in small denomination bills that weigh 100 pounds, go home, spend them, tax out 120 pounds with interest to bring back to New York, when all you got to do is print up 100 pounds worth of small denomination bonds, spend them, tax them out, no interest. Well, they did. Now, good news, Dennis Kucinich in the United States' recent Bill 2990 is to end the Fed by having the U.S. Treasury take over and start spending for infrastructure with U.S. Treasury greenbacks like Abraham Lincoln did. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's give Buchanan credit. Just before Lincoln's administration, Buchanan's the first president who issued Treasury greenbacks something like 16 or 36 million dollars. And then Lincoln used the same idea to fund the Civil War after that. And then, well, Kennedy was going to issue silver certificates, but that didn't last long. It was canceled as soon as it was shot, I believe. So, they don't like the idea of governments issuing their own money. But you've got, and I'm going to all these Occupy and end the Fed groups on the net where they're going, and I'm saying, you got no alternative. Why aren't you supporting Kucinich? His alternative, treasury money. You got no alternative. Now, I mean, 
being nice to people hasn't seemed to work. I feel like <laughs> becoming a Don Rickles out there, you know, and say, you're hurting, you deserve it, sucker, you voted for it, you know, maybe I can make them hate me enough to get some attention. But anyway, so, after 30 some years of, now, I kept running in elections because I kept saying I want to run money like poker chips. And I would be the only candidate who would show up at an election with my own blackjack table to explain to people how poker chips work. That's how stupid they were in those days, you know? But anyway, so I never got elected. 75 elections later, I'm in the Guinness for the records. <laughs> 74, 74 losses. I got 74 losses, and one was called off. So that's why they're too different. But, now, my claim, I know they're weird claims to fame, but I say someday I'm going to get a Nobel Prize for my I over P plus I miracle equation. Last Nobel Prize in economics, because once the riddle is solved, who needs more guy, prizes for guys coming close? Okay? And right now, they all think that raising interest rates fights inflation, and the first guy who walks up and says, killing it kills inflation wins. Then who needs that kind of, you couldn't give, how come they don't give Nobel Prizes who run their chip banks at the poker game well? Because <laughs> everybody runs it well. You don't give prizes for screw up casino cashiers. Why do you give prizes for screw up economists? So anyway, you won't get any more. And my second claim to fame, well, the left software. Someday me and Michael Linton are going to get Nobel Prizes in science for having developed the LED software as freeware for the world because it's been picked up all over the world. And then it got me into the UN with that clerk lady, so that's another neat thing. And then the final one's peace. You know, you news, the guy who started the Grameen Bank, okay, micro-lending they call it, that was in the UN at the same time as my Unilets with the Tobin tax. That's another joke. And uh, now the Grameen Bank is in failure because they were just micro-loan sharking at 20% to groups of five poor people. That's all they were doing. So I said, if they're going to give him a peace prize for micro-loan sharking, what are they going to give to the guy who comes up with macro lending at zero interest? So anyway, I expect that one too. Now, I've got to give a quick plug here before I get into the later part. This video was done by some guys in uh, Brantford in 2003 and 2004, bringing all my stuff up to date till that point. I think it's available here. And uh, so the career's been pretty wild. You know, like one person making a lot of noise, and I've been called, uh, well, you know, they discuss how can we stop people like him in politics, and they've been excluding me from debates. <coughs> like right now, I, had an, I was excluded from a debate, and I took it to the Supreme Court. And the court ruled that Rogers has the right to exclude candidates from debates. I was on the Dragon's Den. Anybody see that show? I was on the Dragon's Den a year and a half ago, and they did a number on me. I had done the story, hey, I'm the, I said, you got 100 chasing 10 watches, economics teaches inflation is shift A. And just before I could say I'm the discoverer of shift B, less watches, cut. And that's what they showed. Half a statement. And I said to them, hey, you know, when I ran for parliament, I said, how come my casino chips don't inflate and my government chips do? Same hardware. Cut. Before I could say, must be a software conclusion. Must be a software problem. So they basically used two eight-second clips of me out of a 15-minute pitch for a local currency and chopped it up, made fun of me, so I sued them for slander and breach of contract. And that's in the Supreme Court of Canada right now. But by suing them, that got that forced them to give me the whole tape of the whole show. With, with me beating up the dragons. Don't forget, I had a Bradford $500 poker chip there. And when O'Leary missed her $5 billion with his $10,500 poker chip shot off his mouth, I said, put your money where your mouth is, sir. I got 500 bucks and he couldn't bet. I made them back down on national TV, so they didn't play that part. But I got it, and I uploaded it YouTube. So, millions of people see the smear job making me look stupid, but only a hundred or so have gone to see the whole show with the truth. So, the fact the truth is out there doesn't mean anyone's going to see it. They're still going to think I'm that lunatic who made no sense about shift A and it's suddenly gone. And, 
Hardware's, you know, gone, you know, so, and then they make insulting stuff like it's like blowing air up a dead horse's ass. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bots and Pizza. Is that how you prepare your horse pizza? Anyway, it was nasty stuff. Go see it. So, but that's the kind of adventures I have, you know. So, over the years, I was in the social, I was in the social credit party, thrown out. But if you look under Canadian social creditors, geez, I'm at the top of the list. You know, before Keekstra, ooh, Fromm and Vuo Taylor, all the anti Semite so creds, you know, and they got me pure anti banker. And then, of course, hey, political party leaders Mel Hurtig, Ernie Schreiber, Elmer Knudsen. Oh, I went to top there anyway, and I've never been elected to anything, you know, and well, cannabis activists. I had, I had seven appeals in the Ontario Court of Appeal all at once last Monday. And the three judges let me make the arguments for them. They were almost going to let me live stream the whole show until the crowd objected. And then they let me tape report it for my notes. But you can go to YouTube and look for MedPot Magnificent 7 for the report of my efforts to legalize the good herb in Canada. You know, we've got to get people off the chemicals and onto the herbal. And, I'm just finishing up me before I get into the future. I wrote my book, which is going to make me famous in the gambling world, Play Hold and Poker Like a Bookie, because I invented every possible mathematical fingers and toes, tricks, tools to play the game that I need, because I'm a professional for like solid 22 years now, just poker. And so I invented all these poker tools to help me and I've done seven instructional videos too, so I can claim I have the highest winning average in the world for the past 22 years. Like the other guys, how many people watch on TV? Daniel Negriano, you heard of him? No, he's the kid who won all the money in Vegas, the Canadian kid from Toronto, Daniel. Anyway, here's a book, Canadian blackjack players and Canadian poker players, and oh, there's Daniel Negriano. Oh, just above him, John C. Turmel again. <laughs> so, if you Google for great Canadian gambler, I come up. So, that is one claim to fame, but my point is this. As a professional gambler, I cannot allow myself to be suckered by a scam. And when I saw that our planet was afflicted by a computerized death gamble contract. I said to myself, geez, I'm the only engineer in the planet specialized in gambling. <laughs> and I'm the and plus with, with electrical engineering and computers, I guess it's my sworn duty to try and fix the malfunction in the bank software. <laughs> and so for the next years, I was into the Supreme Court of Canada eight times against banks asking that they pull out the software, and where you see service charge, and where you see interest, I said restrict the bank's computers to the pure service charge, like a casino. You can take chips out of the pot, charge them per hour, whatever, but abolish the interest charge for more chips than they printed. Over and over and over and over again, the judge always said no, but that's okay, that's the perfect solution to it. So, after all those years of fighting and losses and rejections, in 1993, I did found that political party, and now I'm going to tell you the neat adventure about it, what I did with tax credits. If you gave 1150 bucks worth of stuff to my party, we could give you a $500 tax credit. Now, that means that, you know, I mean, if you got user to lose it stuff, like the motel rooms or... Uh, driving range, or movie seats, or, you know, uh, uh, bowling alleys. Well, give us 1100 worth of stuff, and here's 500 in cash, and tell us to come in on slow nights. So, we also, we get banquets that way. Throw us a banquet for 20 people, cost 1150 and here's a tax credit of 500 from the feds. And, great. And that's how political parties are funded in Canada. We did one neat thing, though. We said, see that computer there for $1,600? Well, I'll tell you what, let's do this tax credit thing over a contract. We'll pay it over four years. And that way you'll end up with four or $500 tax credits for your $1,600 computer over four years. And he went, okay. So the government paid for our computer. The government paid, the government paid for our banquets. But the only problem was that the feds, they had to give us a check which cleared before we could buy the thing back. But provincially, you don't have to do that. 
Provincially, they just give you the receipt for the stuff, and that's it. You don't need to do a check swap. So anyway, in the last election, provincial. Well, I should tell the Ottawa election first. Last year, I'm running in the Ottawa election, and I have this great idea. I'm going to fool people into getting into barter by making them think that the chips are going to be worse on, worth bus rides. So I said, look, I'm out there with my video camera saying to the kids, look, it, would you work for 12 bus ride, 12 buck, bus bucks an hour, two bucks a bus ride? And every kid's going, yeah, 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 yeah. Would you shovel the snow? Would you clean a park? Would you, yeah, 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 all the kids want to work for bus tickets. So instead of having empty buses running around, you got all these kids who can be working for bus tickets. Well, that's kind of cute because just today, there's an article in the Bradford Expositor from yesterday, and some of the comments on the back said, since the Eagle Place bus is never even half full, I agree. Despite what we might think of John Turmel's Bradford bucks would create wealth $2 at a time with every kid putting in his work. Now, in the old days, I used to advertise it as Bradford bucks tax credits. We'll pay you to do stuff for the city with tax credits, and you can pay your taxes with it. So it's really the work that's the basis for the Brantford tax credit bucks. Well, it's really the work of the students that would be the basis for the bus bucks, but everybody's tricked into liking them because they think it's the bus rides. When it's really the work of the kids who created the bus tickets that they're getting. So, that was one other idea, like the Argentine bonds, for municipalities to use an alternate currency to put all their kids to work. And I had one lady said, shit, for old 12 bucks, my husband will work for bus bucks. <laughs> so, I got all these videos up there. And then, of course, during the campaign, unfortunately, I was arrested and charged with child molesting for videotaping the kids at my uh, campaign. See, Tormel charged. But then they eventually stayed the charges because they said, oh, I guess there's nothing wrong with interviewing teenagers on the sidewalk if they wanted to work for bus bucks. But at the time, the principals were hysterical, and the cop just arrested me, threw me in the car. And anyway, they had to drop all the charges, made a little bit of... As a matter of fact, this guy is elbowing me when I say, you touch me once more, Jiu-Jitsu John's going to kick you in the nuts. <laughs> well, guess what? The guy who elbowed me charged me with uttering a threat. In, in, re in response to his elbowing me. And they charged me. So when they saw the video, they were feeling pretty bad and they withdrew the charges. So anyway, but that's the kind of noise and news trying to get that message out. Now, here comes the next election. Well, the federal one. And I tried the neighbor heart too. In Eberhardt's day, 1935, he was a radio preacher explaining in the depths of the Great Depression the, you know, the misery and the poverty and how the banksters were responsible and how he could issue some provincial currency that would allow people to go back to work. And he swept the power in one election from zero to like 80, 90 percent of the seats in one election. And I said, and he didn't even run. He said, you vote my slate, you get me. So I said, gee, I may as well do the same thing. How many people out there are pro Let's? Well, I remember it was on the Let's official party program, the Greens, 25 years ago. The Christian Heritage supported it, the Libertarians supported it, the, uh, a lot of parties did, <coughs> even at some NDP. So anyway, I wrote to all of them, Marxist-Leninists, imagine that, the Marxist-Leninists signed, yes, Canada Let's, and that's their central organization. Hey, when their leader died, Baines, Hario Baines, they invited me to his funeral. A capitalist professional gambler being invited to the Marxist Manifest Leader's funeral. You understand the funniness there? Because they too don't like the banksters and the loan sharpen. And they've been misrepresented too. So I then said, okay, there were some overlaps, Marxist, Leninist, Libertarian, I gotta try and pick these. So I started flipping coins. But by the end of the election, I had someone in, and I said, these are the parties I advise you to vote for because they have endorsed Let's in the past and they're more likely to endorse it now. Plus, they're more likely to legalize marijuana so we can mass produce it to provide it free to people who are gonna need to deal with the cancers from Fukushima that are coming. I explained in my videos during that election, I'm the only political leader screaming, take cover, you know? You ever heard of duck and cover? Well, this is the time. Yeah. And I said, you're going to watch miscarriages and baby deaths go up in BC. Sure enough, 200% extra baby deaths. I was right. 
I'm not laughing. I just mean to say that that's the very day, March 25th, when Health Canada shut down the radiation fallout detectors. So they wouldn't have to go, watch out! And you say, why didn't you tell us? Oh, there was so little radiation, we just figured we'd turn them off. Oh, why don't you do that for your fire alarms? <laughs> We've had so few fires this year, we're turning them all off. Yeah. Government of Canada. people that you got to start taking your baking soda because baking soda binds with radioactive particles and is very alkaline and prevents cancers for that reason so I've been spiking mine in my mama's water with baking soda for the last months I've given up dairy because these hot spots come down the cows eat it you're gonna get a batch of hot stuff one day 15 pounds lighter no dairy so anyway things have changed since Fukushima it's a catastrophe we've likes of which we've never seen before. I've been thinking that, boy, we're gonna, the Mayan prophecy is going to be fulfilled on time and we'll go from the hell of debts to a heaven of interest-free credits. And now heaven looks like it's going to be a damn nuclear cleanup job for the next 10,000 years. <laughs> Thanks, Rothschilds, for screwing up your ownership of the planet. You disgusting, filthy pigs with your cut corners engineering. Don't forget every nuclear power plant was built by the cheapest bidder, right? Think about that. So anyway, if we don't decommission, we're, in, we're being threatened, and they don't have the money to decommission. And the only thing that's going to pay them is provincial bonds to put the unemployed people to work to decommission nuclear and build all safer alternatives. So, now to the really good news. I get it. Oh no, I'm going to tell you one other story before I meet in that final good news. Back in 1985, I'm looking for a way to help people. I'm looking for a way to, you know, I'm always looking for a way to come up with a new currency and trick people into using it. So, in 1984-5, I'm looking at a newspaper, and I see all these discount coupons. Oh, I see these booklets of coupons, you know, and they come in, and I say, which one am I going to cut out for how much? And I said, geez, wouldn't it be smarter if they took all 30 names with the discount and they put it on one coupon? And then I could have 30 names times 30, I could have 900 stores on one page. If they didn't do it so stupidly, a coupon per store. You'd have to come up with a no-name coupon. So, I said I'll come up with a no-name coupon. And the way to do that is to print a no-name coupon and attach it to a list of a thousand different places where you'll get your discount. And you know how I sold it to these guys? I walked up and I said, I got 63 hairdressers, 93 restaurants, even Pizza Pizza, except competitors' coupons. Our top guy was 50% and they started taking them. Wow, I'm handing these out to the cop shops and hospitals and fire departments, and but no one ever came and bought them. And that's how we're supposed to make our money. So anyway, I explained to a businessman, here's a deal. Normally you put out your own discount coupon, you gotta pay for the printing, the distribution, and the discount. What we'll do is we'll pay the printing, we'll pay the distribution by selling the coupons to the customers who will get the discount for 25 cents, and then you just lose the discount. You want free advertising? If they come in, it worked. If they don't come in, it's free. I got nine guys in my first hour, and there's a list of a thousand stores. Yeah. Now, I couldn't make it pay. I couldn't make people buy. But I'll tell you something. For five years after we'd shut down, we still had little Chinese ladies come knock on our door and buy them. We used to have racks of the coupons. And they were smart. I could call up any one of these stores right now and say, I'm looking at a 1985 directory that says you'd give 10% off on this gold nugget. Can I come in and use it? What do you think the guy's going to say? Yeah, of course he will, 10%. So it's that easy to get them on. I couldn't make that work, but that's going to come in soon, later. An improvement on that. I found a way of making it free for the business. Free, totally. Oh, hey! So here I am now in the provincial election, and I get a call from a friend of mine, Michael Green, who'd been in the Green Party. Great man. When I was thrown out of the Green Party, he took the LED software and fought for it and got it put on the program in 88. And within five years, someone had taken it off. I guess they decided interest-free current wasn't so green dollars weren't so green no more. So anyway, that's Green Party politics. Banksters got moles everywhere. 
Just go read Secret Team by uh, Fletcher Party to appreciate how they grab everybody come out of university. Join the Secret Team and everybody will plug you all the way up. So anyway, we then started, we now have the gift certificates ready to go soon. He calls me, says, I want to form a political party. You want to be a candidate in my party? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. This takes like 10,000 signatures or half the writings covered. He said, no, they changed the rules. It only takes two guys now. I said, holy jeez. The holy golden, what, not, the holy grail, I meant to say, of political finance. I can now, so I registered a political party with me and a buddy in London. He's an exemptee who's suffering horrible illnesses and fighting in the courts as well, but he ran. And we registered a pauper party of Ontario. <laughs> poor people party. Hey, wait a minute now, we're paupers. We admit we're poor, but we know that it was a rat rigged game, so we don't feel too ashamed, okay? Yeah, stop that, doesn't worry me, you know. Just like when I lose my elections, I don't get invited to the debates. You think, I feel bad I got cheated? No. I, I got cheated and I lost. You think I feel bad? Anyway, I then register a political party. And if you go to YouTube and you look for Popper Party, you'll find the video at Laurier, where I say to Dave Levac, the sitting MP who was recently re elected, I said, Dave, now that I'm a political party just like you, I can say to every pizzeria in town, send me 400 bucks in pizza to my party for the soup kitchen. They get 300 government money. Right, Dave? And he had to go, yeah. <laughs> Now, political parties, why didn't they think of doing that? Well, they think of contributions for their own use in the box. They're not thinking of contributions of food for the poor, financed by the government money. I thought of that. I thought outside the yeah. box. Now, and I like to joke that the OPP called the raid on Casino Termel Project Robin Hood, and now Robin Hood's got a tunnel into the sheriff's vault, and I can hand out 1240 in tax credits to everybody in Ontario. Watch me go. I was at the Occupy. Say, I can't pay you for your time, but I can give you 75 cents on the dollar for your out-of-pocket expenses. Since I approve. And I'm there picketing too. Both London and Toronto said, so keep your expenses. I can cover them. 75% of your money back. Every one of our enterprises now that everybody who came here from a distance, you got your gas receipts, send them to me. I'll have the, my chief financial officer send you a tax credit 75% of your gas back. Meals, if, if it's got the right date, today's date, we'll give you 75% of your money back. That's the power Robin Hood scored at the sheriff's vault. So anyway, now the neat stuff about the tax credits. So that's the deal. They give us 400, they get three. If they give us 2,800, they get 1,240. That's the max. Now, they can give us 9,000 to get 1,240, but it takes 28 to get 1,240, and it takes 400 to get 300. Now, let's say you have a use it or lose it business, like those ones I said, motels, bowling alleys, movie tickets. It's a free 1,240 bucks if you give our party a gift certificate for 2800 in movies. Now, how do we know you've earned the $2,800 gift certificate back? All of our guys are going to be having gold nuggets. And we're going to start a gold nugget directory. And beside your name, we're not going to list a discount. We're going to list a redemption rate. So that if you are trying to get your 2800 back right away, you'll take 100% gold nuggets on your motel rooms or your movies on Tuesday nights. But let's say you have something that costs money. Carpets. You got 75% cost of production. Well, you can't afford to give us three Gs for only 1200, 56% discount. You might not even be able to afford a 30% discount. But here's a neat thing. We say, how about if you give us the 2800 in carpeting for the 1240 and we buy another 2800 in cash? And we can do that by you taking the nuggets 50-50 with cash. And by the time you've got the 2800 in nuggets, you've got another 2800 in cash too. So it's not 56% on the deal, it's 28. And if that's still too high, take 25% cash and 75% nuggets. And now it's going to be the original 28 for us, where you bite 16 loss, but you get 11,000 in sales for that 16 loss. That's only 14%, a quarter. So the formula for figuring out what the actual political cost of the donation is, your redemption rate times 56%. 
Here's an example. On our system with the gold nuggets, we had a guy here, a gas bar, 9 or 10 or 11 stores, and he was offering $1 off of 15. Well, that's 7%. Well, we say to him, I tell you what, take 10% nuggets and 90% cash, you'll give us the 2800 in free gas, and then you'll lose 16, but we'll buy 28000 in total gas. It's like getting a $50 fill-up, <coughs> 45 cash, five in gold nuggets. And the neat thing about gold nuggets over the discount coupons is that you can respend them in the other stores. So that... The 10% you're actually giving up now and taking in nuggets, you used to give it up as a discount, now you're getting barter credits that you can go respend. So if you respend the barter credits you take in, you got the total deal free. You got to go list your offer, come and do some dealing with me, I'll take so many redemption barter bucks, and then by spending them all again, it cost him nothing. So, I, now, this just hit me like two weeks ago. I'm saying, wow, I could have done this 20 years ago. Come up with a way to kickstart a barter system just with everybody starting with 10% barter bucks, especially with the stores who are already used to kissing off 10% to 20% discounts. How about just taking them in barter bucks and respending them? So, that's going to be going up at a website later this week where businesses will be able to come and log on. I got a gift certificate, make out a gift certificate, temporary tax credit, and then at the end of the year, our chief financial officer sends them an official Government of Ontario tax credit for that gift certificate. And we can do anything we want with it. We can give it away, we can give it to our members, everybody can go back to their own ridings and start your own constituency associations. Everything you take in is yours. You send 10% to us in gold nuggets. In case I come to your town, I'll stay in one of your motels. And basically, you keep everything else. And you pay yourselves with your own newly created money. So, this is an opportunity for every pro-marijuana, pro-anti-bank, pro-anything good activity who want to finance their activities with government tax credits to take advantage of the new machine I've captured which allows out-of-the-box thinking. And the best thing of all is with $1,250 returns these days instead of 500 20 years ago, that means that it's not going to be a $1,600 computer we got for four payments of 500 two G's. It'll be a $4,000 computer we can get over a four-year contract for total payment of 1254 times 5 G's. Same numbers work all the time. Whatever the product is they're going to give us, 4 G's, they end up with 25% <coughs> more in the contract. All paid for by the government. So you can start your constituency association, get furniture, get computer, get cars. If the man owns the business and both pay taxes, double it! An $8,000 car paid 10000 over four years. Double all the contribution. If the man owns the theater and files his own personal return, he can buy a sales slip for 2800 and send it to us and get his tax credit, 1250 1250 So I'm hoping that when it starts that the merchants of Ontario are going to appreciate the value of being connected to a barter system which lets them start like 5, 10, 15, 20%. And as they end up spending more and more and more of it because the stores around them are taking it, and this is the reverse of Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law says bad money chases up the good. When the cheaper debased currency comes in, people choose to use it before the gold. Gresham's Law. Well, actually, when our good currency paper comes in, People are going to use it rather the interest-bearing stuff. Now, you might call the interest-bearing stuff the good and our interest-free stuff the bad, but that's actually the reverse. Our stuff is the good chasing out the bad. So why would people want to use their interest-bearing bank cash they need for their mortgages and hydro and telephone when they can use their barter bucks instead? So that great advantage is going to happen. People aren't even going to be aware of how the barter system is being instituted by sucking them in with a little 10% of the time. 
Now, when you do go to the, on, the, the site, you're going to be able to issue your own checks. But the checks are going to be in standard denominations. So you're going to be issuing your own currency. So you'll see a list of stores in your town and say, geez, I wouldn't mind buying pizza at this place. So you're going to go to your printer, you're going to log on, and you're going to say, I want to take out six 12-nugget 12, six 12 bills. So we give him serial numbers, he prints it out, cuts it out, and then he walks in with a 12-nugget bill, pays. He'll put his picture on it. Remember the uh, guy, Friendly Favors? Wasn't that neat? Put your picture on your currency. And in Mexico City, to prevent fraud, they had 10 people had to co-sign on the back before it became non-co-signable. So we could add a few co-signers on the back in different signatures just to sort of guarantee more likely. But the first person who signs has to see the guy's picture is on the note. And then the next person who signs is going to know him because he can see his card. So we all get a picture ID card. We all are allowed to issue our own currency, our own checking accounts paid for with time or with cash at some point. And uh, that's all they have to print. And the merchants, they can print out a decal. Now, I had these things all over Ottawa. So you didn't even need the list. All you had to do, oh, sorry. It goes on the, you know, on the thing like this. So all you had to do was be driving on the bus, and I might have even issued a small little, oh, here's two free gold nuggets. Just look for a gold nugget decal and go in, cut them out, and get your percentage. So as you're driving along, you see all these things in the stores with the different deal you could possibly get. So the same thing's going to happen again, but they print it out. So now what's neat is a political party doesn't pay taxes. So by running this machine through the political party, we get to keep all our money. And we can divert all of it towards anti-poverty stuff. Me, I don't need money. All I need is enough to get into the next game and I can win enough. So, you know what I mean? All I need is people, my friends, who will give me an interest for your loan if I'm ever broke. What do I need money for? You know, let the guys who are insecure have need a big pile to sit on to feel proud. You know? I, like, anyway, what can I say? Those are rich guys. Those are rich guys who think their pile of money is what made them and they're right. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's it now. We have the, let me see now, the businesses. The, yeah, it's all there. So that is the machinery that's available for us to take advantage of. You go back to your town, you find a president, a secretary, a financial officer, and an internet officer. Financial officer keeps track of your gift certificates and your gold nuggets you hand out to the kids and the people. And the internet officer uploads your directory to us because in 99, I traveled Europe 39 nights out of 40. Paid with an IOU for a night back in Canada. Worth five hours. In France, they pay themselves 60 green francs an hour. In Germany, 20 green marks. In Britain, 6 green pounds. In Canada, 12 green dollars. States, 10 green Ithaca hours. I mean, dollars for an Ithaca hour. But between countries, hours. So when I got back after my 39 nights, I sat down. I emailed IOU 20 hours to the lady and the guy in France, Paris who put us up. I owe you 15 hours for the lady in Helsinki put us up. I owe you 10 hours for the two nights in Bordeaux. And if they ever contact me, say we're coming to town, or one of our friends is, if I can't find, if I can't put them up, I'll find someone who will. And in the meantime, at my Facebook page, I set up my own personal Unilets account right now. It has my offers. I do accordion concerts, editing, translating, stuff like that. What I want, history books, old history books and accommodations and stuff. And my record. I have all these spendings in Europe and all that, that whole trip, like two, three hundred hours. And on the other side, I do accordion concerts at retirement homes every Tuesday. Oh. Set to practice. But the point is, I can register my hours myself on my page. I don't need someone paying me with a job. Any 12-year-old kid can announce, I'm going to be going to the park and cleaning up every piece of scrap, cigarette butt, dog shit, three hours every Saturday, and just keep putting them up. He contacts you and says, I'm coming to your town. Can you find me a room? Is anybody going to think this kid's a user? This card becomes your shingle, where the things you've done you're proud of can be registered. So every person who's ever been a volunteer just got to count up the hours they put in over the last 20 years and go put it up there. 
You understand? They already do this in the States. Volunteer hours are the currency. And just because you never got credit for it in the past, you got proof. I'm giving you credit for it now. So that is how a simple a time bank can work. People who are volunteers in animal shelters, you think everybody else who's a volunteer in an animal shelter won't put them up when they want to travel? It's the same kind of volunteerism. Driving old people around, taking them, you know, this kind of stuff. So time banking is almost here. Now the Mayan prophecy, which scares a lot of people, oh no, this wonderful world we have is going to get worse. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking this hell of a world is going to get better. Because I've always known that to trip switch from hell to heaven is as easy as reprogramming, upgrading the bank software to less. We've never been more than a software switch away from fixing our banking system for the past. Hey, I ask the Supreme Court of Canada every time. Restrict the bank's computers to a pure service charge. Fix the software. So, I honestly think that I find it incredible that someone thousands of years ago could have, could have possibly predicted that we would switch from hell to heaven in the right year. And it's amazing that it could be the year because there seems to be a general awakening now about the problems with banking and money, even though if most people don't know what to do. They know, end the Fed, end the Fed, and they feel good and they're marching. And you go, what do you replace it with? Well, I don't know, but we've got to end the Fed first. You know, so. But now we have Dennis Kucinich in the United States. You got me with my Argentine solution. And because the Argentine solution is so pervasive in general, if you go look, now I ran for mayor of Ottawa and Brantford and Prime Minister of Ontario, so from 81, and Prime Minister of Canada in 93. And if you go look YouTube for Prime Minister of the Planet, you'll see I'm the only declared candidate. And, I mean, you may laugh, but I think the Gold Nugget Network has the opportunity to go viral because en français, des pipites d'or. I mean, sure, our nuggets, 12 nuggets to the hour, pretty big nuggets. But in France, those nuggets are one-fifth as small, 60 little pipit doll to an hour. And in England, it's only six big gold nuggets to the little tiny one-tenths in France. But between countries, all those numbers of nuggets always add up to one hour pale. So the gold nugget will be able to represent the old money, national money, with a unit that everybody is familiar with. And I was sitting here saying how serendipitous that I would have had all this artwork done for a totally different thing that will now fit so perfectly as I make fun of the suckers who are trying to come up with gold out of digging out of the ground when we found a way out of doing it by printing it with paper. <laughs> Either way, it's going to get you an hour of time and an hour of labor. So, on that note, keep track of popperparty.ca. Within a week, we're going to have an opportunity for you to log on, set up your own constituency association, start organizing your own goodies as you organize your own barter network in your neighborhood. Okay, you start with every single mother who's got kids so that they all list what night they're free to babysit so one can babysit three families while the other three girls go out partying and I could be there. So anyway, <laughs> and responsible for getting them out to the party. So anyway, <laughs> on that note, keep track of the popperparty.ca and the goldnuggetnetwork.com or info or org. And I hope within a week we'll have a machine set up where any poor people can log on and empower themselves with the government's tax credits that they can hand out to all their friends and businesses who can qualify. If you're filing taxes, there's a form here in the government, your tax form, ah, it was there, maybe I folded it somewhere. Well, you know on your tax form there's a spot there, Provincial Ontario Tax Credit 1240 maximum. Well, I can give the max to everybody. If it's from now on, keep, keep your expenses. If you're going to, like this, this is a perfect example. 
Every expense here tonight, you were at the McDonald's, you got the receipt, I'll give you 75% of your money back. There it is, by the way, it was in front of me. So there's a spot where you can get your 1240, and none of these guys almost ever get it. And finally, if you want to help your brother-in-law's business, you can go buy 2800 worth of stuff and submit it to us with a sales slip, and you'll get the tax credit for helping us buy at your brother's shop. You understand the opportunities here? So it'll all be explained. As a matter of fact, I, I did a speech at the inventors where I did it, but I'll be posting this so it's explained right here again if you want to hear it. Nice. What was that book? You said to read again? About? Oh, the I didn't bring that up. I did the translation. There's a book called Secret Team by Prouty. Oh, yeah, Fletcher Prouty Secret Team. Basically, the CIA approaches all sharp, young, rich kids out of university and says, if you join our secret team, take a six-month course, you'll be an undercover CIA all your life. Hopefully, you'll never have to do anything, but you'll vote for the guys we tell you to, and our guys will vote for you, and you'll all end up at the top, and you might never have to do a dirty deed, but if we call on you, you'll have to do the dirty deed. And just like East Germany could hire one-third of their people to look at two-thirds of their spy on two-thirds, believe me, they got all the money. They can watch on all of us, and they have. And Fletcher Prouty explained the way they did it in his book, how the secret team works and runs the United States. And that's what impressed me. Who in his right mind is going to refuse the offer to get in on a secret cabal who are already there and will vote to promote you? and you'll be told who your guys are to promote them. And that's why their guys end up at the top of almost all hierarchies. When I started fighting to legalize marijuana 10 years ago, Canada's top lawyer came out against me, stabbed us in the back. Canada's top publisher came out against, printed all sorts of malicious lies and untruths. And Canada's top politician, I went to the leadership convention I wanted to run, so they called off the election. <laughs> so I'm just saying that that is how he explains the controllers move up in all hierarchies. They get into a new plane and they're helpful and they got money to contribute. And people love money to contribute. Your organization loves them pretty, pretty soon. And then they get elected higher and higher and higher. And that's how they end up in control. And I saw that when I fought the marijuana fights over here. The whole establishment, all narc moles, couldn't believe it, the stuff they ended up pulling up over the years. So, yeah, they do that, but we can get off their system by simply starting our own, like I did at my Facebook page. Start your own, Uniset, Unilets, look for that. And the instructions and how I set my page up, how I Uniset, Unilets, you can do it too. And that way, next time you go traveling and someone has to put you up and you can't pay them, you can acknowledge your debt in public. And that way, other people will say, these are good people. They helped someone else. Yeah? The, uh, the book again, please, the book and the author. These oh, guys. that book was called Secret Team by Fletcher Prouty. F-L-A-T-C-H-E-R Prouty. P-R-O-U-T-Y. Great book. He was the guy in the JFK movie, Donald Sutherland. He was the guy who had been sent away, who would have normally run JFK's security, who'd been sent away for no good reason to the South Pole, and then realized when the hit happened that it was a black op, and that they had the whole package about Oswald in New Zealand the day before it happened, or an hour or so before. Neat stuff. So it's an incredible book, and I've read it twice or three times. But basically, they're up there, but they can't stop us. Example, in Africa, Muammar Gaddafi financed the satellite system for Africa, St. Gaddafi. And that's and why he's gone. And, uh, yeah. and the point is, with that satellite system, people who had no bank accounts, poor people, they all have cell phones. Okay? Doesn't matter how poor you are, you can afford a $30 cell phone and whatever it costs. But what Safari Com M Pisa did was, they said, we're going to allow you to transfer text messages to transfer minutes from your phone to someone else's. So that if you want to send some value to the butcher in your village so he gives meat to your mama, you can transfer cell phone minutes. Now, that's time trading as effectively as will ever be done. Now, why can't we use our cell phones and transfer our cell phone credits to other people's credits? Because we still have stuff the banks want to steal.
<laughs> and in Africa, it's already gone and owned by them already. So they have a complete population that is destitute with nothing but their time as their wealth, except now they've come up with their own electronic chips, time credits with their phone and PESA, with St. Gaddafi's doing. And that's why you don't hear about starvation and riots in Africa anymore, except where the U.S. is fomenting war. Yeah. Yeah. But other than where the U.S. has got its nose, Africa's quiet. Same with Latin America. They've got community currencies in all their countries now. Yeah. Big. You don't hear about food riots or problems from there anymore. Mm -hmm. Just where America's trying to make war. So the revolution is happening, and my program, Global, is... Aspirin, global aspirin, ASA, amnesty, amnesty for all financially induced crime. If you did it while you were short of money, for money, you're off, you're forgiven. Here's an interest-free credit card for security. Change your name if you're ashamed of what you did from Rothschild and Rockefeller to Smith. <laughs> and with global amnesty, security, and anonymity, we can get on with partying in heaven, and we don't even need to deal with the crimes of the past. We'll let God deal with that later. Thank you, John. Oh. Hi, I'm here, John Turmel, with my... Going on, this is our 30th year, I believe. It is. You know, back in 1981, uh, the Lowell Green Show allowed me to make contact. And then a few years later, it was the Mrs. Metcalf uh, Fight the Bank uh, foreclosure where we again got involved because of the, the lawyer, John Gorman, who was right. helping there. And uh, so for like all these years, Tom Kennedy was a school teacher and he used to sit up at nights and he would write a newsletter on interest-free banking and in the lead systems and had a newsletter for many, many years, one of the first, I believe, in Canada. It was called Leeds. L-E-A-D-S, right? And you want to tell us more about your adventures for a while now? Okay, hello. Well, my name is Tom Kennedy. I, I grew up on a farm, went to high school, then went to Ottawa Teachers College and became a teacher. And I had my teaching career in Ottawa for 34 years. And it was, uh, it was 1980 that I had my first part of the awakening. I, I read a book by uh, Gary Allen called None Dare Call It Conspiracy. And of course, when you look at that book the first time back in 1980, you say, this can't be true. And the more, uh, the more I did some research on what Gary Allen pointed out about what was going on in, in the world of politics and power and banking and money, the more I find out that he just touched the tip of the iceberg. And I, uh, my first time of actually hearing John speak was on a radio talk show in Ottawa, hosted by Lowell Green at the time. And I remember, I just remember Lowell Green, after John had hung up in that talk show encounter, had made some kind of comment that made fun of John. And by that time I had had this in my mind that if the media is making fun of somebody, I want to meet them in person and find out what they're really saying. So that's uh, when I kind of pursued it and then I had an opportunity to meet John shortly after that. And as my teaching career went through the 1980s, I was learning more and more about money and banking and the problems associated with that. And I was learning about the uh, first Let's software that John Trammell and Michael Lennon had a part in creating and launching. And uh, everything's just evolved since then. And now we're in 2011. and. We're pretty close to having uh, everything is there, so we can make our time currents, our time currencies work. And of course, these these uh, time currencies or community currencies are free of interest, and I like to call them usury free time currencies. And what's your moniker on the net, sir? Oh, my moniker on the net is right now Tommy Usury Free Kennedy. Just a word about that. When I started this out, when I started the internet in the late 1990s, I had uh, I was known as Tommy No Usury, and I. I was talking about the no usury network and the and the no usury revolution, and I went to a, a conference in Salmon Arm, British Columbia, in 2002. And after I spoke at that conference, a gentleman came up to me and he talked to me about language, and he said, "You know, you might have, you might want to change your your words and drop out the negatives and use positives." So he suggested the usury free network, and he suggested that I change my moniker from Tommy No Usury to Tommy Usury Free. So I did. And then he said even the word revolution and resolution are different. So it became the usury-free resolution instead of the usury-free revolution. 
So just some words about language, and I'm happy I made those changes. Well, what do you think? You think the world can be fixed within a year? Does it feel like it's coming that fast? Well, uh, you you know that I always used to write back in the 1990s that oh, yeah. my, my, we're going to have peace and plenty by 2020. That was a Buckminster Fuller, Buckminster Fuller quote. And I was always saying because it can be done instantaneous and I'm going to hope it's tomorrow. That's right. So we're getting closer. Yeah. Maybe 2012 will be our year. Well, it would be neat to hit the Mayan prophecy, wouldn't it? It certainly would. To go from the hell we're in to heaven. Just by doing what Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors for heaven on earth. But they changed it to forgive us our sins for heaven in the afterlife for the suckers who buy it. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, Tommy, you've run your no usury, uh, your usury free uh, day and your usury free week events now. This is your seventh year at it. Yeah, let, let me just uh, give you a little background about that. When I finished my teaching career, I moved back to my hometown of Tamworth in the country. A little small country town. Uh, not too far from Kingston, Ontario, and it's in eastern Ontario, but it's in a rural, economically depressed area. And uh, anyway, with some friends, I launched the uh, Tamworth Hours as a usually free time currency for Tamworth, where one hour of one hour of Tamworth time was worth a dollar. Anyway, I worked at that and launched it in 2004. Yeah. 2004 it was launched, and on our we launched that in November 2004. So on the first anniversary, which would have been November 2005. We decided to celebrate the one-year anniversary of Tamworth Hours, and that's when we come up with the idea of making usury free day on November the 13th. Why November the 13th? Well, I just like 13, and since the the system didn't like us using 13, I decided that's a good day to make it for usury free day, and then the week following, from the 13th of November to the 19th, becomes usury free week. And during that week, we focus on two things: doing meetings and gatherings of people. And we, we talk about the problems associated with uh, what I call the design flaw of usury. That's poverty, pro problems like poverty and lack, wars, violence, and scarcity. Those are all connected in there. And then we talk about the solutions as offered by the usury free community currency network and all that, how, how that can empower the people in the local communities. And so we had our first usury free day on November the 13th, 2005. So this week, which is now in 2011. This is our seventh annual Usury Free Week, and we had a very good launch on Usury Free Day, November the 13th, 2011, at Conspiracy Culture in Toronto. Yeah, that was a fun crowd, and you're watching it. You've just watched it already. My speech to the uh, to the Usury Free Day group at the Conspiracy Culture store in while well, we're occupying Toronto. So. Thanks a lot, Tom Kennedy, for being my ally for so many years. It's been so comforting to have someone to understand when so so few others did. Just want to uh, mention this. Now. Oh, yeah. We have usury during, during usury free week. We give these wing lion awards. So what's a wing lion award? Well, first of all, a note, a note about the wing lion. The wing lion is a symbol that was on usury free currencies in Europe in times way gone past. I learned about that in the mid 1980s when I just started doing my research. And I, kind of, I find it interesting that if we look at our modern banks in Canada, we see the Royal Bank, they still have the lion, but they clipped off his wings. Anyway, so these winged lion awards, are, are they're nominate, people are nominated for work they do in promoting usury-free community currencies and exposing what I call the lies, deceit, and deception around our orthodox banking system of usury-based debt money. And one person who keeps on doing that uh, year after year is John Trammell. So this Wing Lion Award was earned by John Trammell for 2011. Thank so you very your, much. Your Wing Lion Award. Merci beaucoup. It's not, it's a different distinction, you know, when the world is making fun of you and yet there's a small group of people who understand that we're just a flipping a switch away from heaven. So we're almost there. Let's hope we both there's a, there's see a that. There's a quotation on the bottom and it's probably worth reading. None of us is free from usury until all of us are free from usury. And that's why we've got to go after the global banking software with the upgrade to Unilets. Thanks, Tom. It was Thank a you, pleasure John. this year. I'm glad I have this video to now upload so people can watch it. Thank you. Brought Thank everything you. up to date.